Who are you? Tell us about yourself. My name is Jerry Barry. I am I'm an artist. I've been an artist all my life. Um, I have, I'm also a teacher, an art educator. Uh, and there is another side of me. Um, I would say I'm, I'm a poet and writer. Uh, most people who know me don't know that side of my, uh, my personality because I've kept that like a kind of um, uh, private to myself. Uh, but I have, I have been, um, I've been working on landscapes, and I've done a series of landscapes before these paintings, and they are called the Park series, really. And I've introduced those to you before. But this set of paintings that I am doing, I'm about to show you would be different from the landscapes in some ways and very similar to it in others, which I would like to explain um, when I get into the meat of it. What is, it, what is the transition series? Uh, the transition series is a collection of paintings that goes beyond the nostalgia of the of the park series or the landscapes that I have been doing. Uh, let's say um, the, the landscape paintings um, deal more with um, appreciating nature, um, reading the aesthetics um, through your life environment, appreciating nature more or less. Uh, in the paintings, I tried, or I, I should say, I actually arrived at the point where I started to give some philosophical um, explanations to the paintings because paintings themselves don't need to be just decorations. They, need, they can be also centers of concentration and meditation. Uh, the, the transition series that I'm about to show you is similar in to the landscapes, only that instead of looking at a scenery or an image, we are actually looking at humanity, at the human mind. We are, lo we are looking at the landscapes of the human mind and the human experience, the environment that the human being has created. Uh, in, I am trying in this series to bring out uh, to us a picture of ourselves within as, a, as human beings, as a species on the face of this earth. That is why I call these my philosophical paintings. They comment on social, political, and well, of, of course, religious, spiritual issues. So uh, the, the um, so while the landscapes focus on, on the beauty of nature, that, that is um, a physical environment, the transition focuses on the, on the, the nature of the, of the landscape within. Uh, too often, we do not see ourselves within the context of the environment in which we live. We say that the environment makes you, but generally we don't see ourselves within the context of the, of the landscape. We just exist within it. Now, that can be a, a problem because when we live our lives that way, we become victims of our own existence as human beings. So when you look at a uh, uh, the, the image of the light, you don't you think that those are abstract paintings or 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 the concepts are very abstract um, but in many ways they're not 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 for me at least because I've lived them I've internalized them and um, they mean a lot to me uh, it's, it's a way of in which I talk to myself 
about the issues that surrounded me and around, uh, that's going on around the world. Uh, so the issues and events become the settings in which the paintings were placed. They are the landscapes and the human beings with it. So I'm placing the human mind as the, as the view, the light in which you look into yourself in these paintings. So when you look at the images, they're not really abstract. They are really symbols or metaphors. Uh, you may be able to read into them and pick up the images. And this is what I would like my viewers to do. Just look and search for the images yourself and see if you can pick something up for yourself when you look at these paintings. Because the symbol, instead of a tree or a house or so on, I use, I create a symbol. So when you see a person, it's not just the person, it's the person within the context of the issue that, that the um, painting is trying to represent. You see, I did that because, um, now, please don't think I'm dealing with psychology here. Uh, psychology may be involved, but it's not psychology. Think more in terms of aesthetics. Uh, we are an aesthetic being, you know. Um, <coughs> aesthetics is the basis of our human existence, really. Um, and it influences all our aspirations. So in almost everything we do, there is a bit of aesthetics in it, if not a lot of it. Uh, <coughs> at, at a physical level, at a social level, at a spiritual level, and also at a conceptual level. Uh, so even as we admire something, we admire it because there is an aesthetic pull from within us towards that thing. Well, it doesn't only happen in terms of looking at pictures and paintings. It happens in the way we live our lives. So <clears throat> I'm taking aesthetics to another level in which uh, I'm attempting to help uh, my viewer to become more um, uh, functionally literate. You see, when, when you are functionally literate, when you begin to become conscious of being functional literate, you make your own connections. When you make your own connection, um, they, you, you can, there's no limit to what you can do with yourself. Why did you name the series Transition? Um, originally, this series was intended to be um, called the Middle Passage. And that's an interesting story. Because, uh, and another thing too, it was, I had all, I, I, live in, I lived in Guyana, um, where there was a lot of wood. And at the time when I really conceived of doing this series, I thought of it only in terms of wood carvings, massive wood carvings. Uh, <clears throat> But somewhere along the line, I changed. I changed my mind because um, wood would have limited me a lot in what I wanted to say. I, I, I realized that. But the series got started. Um, the, the very idea where the very first time I conceived of doing this series was when I had a conversation with a very popular um, black American artist named Tom Feelings. My friend um, Harold Bascom lived in the same street where I lived at the time and he invited me over to dinner to meet this great artist. So I, I, while I sat with him at dinner, we were opposite each other at the table. And uh, as we talked about a great many other things, we arrived at this point about the, the, the Middle Passage, Tom Feelings had done some wonderful drawings, those of which I admired. As a matter of fact, those were the first drawings of uh, an African-American that I really admired that much. So I was really elated to meet this man. And as I looked at him across the table, he asked, what are your deepest feelings? And I said, well, I like everything about your work. 
I like the drawings. I'm just elated by this book. But there's one little thing I don't like about it. And I explained that, uh, yeah, while it does do a lot to um, represent the narrative of the slave issue, it does, in fact, cast a bad light on, uh, of, it sends a wrong message to our young people. And, of course, I explain. And in the course of your, the paintings, you will see what I mean. And we talked a little more, and he said, look, I didn't see it that way. That is your job. You pick it up from there. And I made a resolution at that point in time that I will indeed do that. Well, that became an obsession with me over the years, and it has remained with me all these years from since then. It was since, it was around 1974, 75 when I met Tom Feeling. And until now, I am still deep in this resolution. Now, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to turn the descriptive, that is, the, the way of just looking at life and not, not uh, even looking at images and connecting them with meanings, um, taking the narrative and moving it to the instructive, where you could learn something from what you see, something that is very, very ordinary. And even if it has to provoke you. And so you will notice with some of my paintings here, they are very, very provocative. If the closer you get to them, the more you will see. I, 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 you know, we must move on from the show and tell to the teach and preach, where we could look at art and tell yourself something within yourself. So the, the fact is, what I'm trying to do is to use the narrative to get to the conceptual. Um, spirit, the spiritual consciousness and the meanings and the insinuations from within. How did you control or contain all these different ideas from issues for these paintings? Well, as I said before, uh, if we are looking at the landscape of the human mind, Every issue becomes a landscape in itself. Just like I approach the scenes in the Central Park, Prospect Park, or even a scene in Guyana in the countryside. Um, there are issues, for example, one such issue would be the issue of slavery, which has been discussed over the years, and, and uh, uh, that topic has been rolled over, mused over in very many ways. Um, there, is, there are other issues, but we should not be stuck just within, um, the, within the limitation of what we see before our eye. We must think beyond, beyond it and um, what is there in it that um, we can do to improve ourselves. Now, as I'm saying, it's, a, it's the human being within his landscape. The landscape will only change when he changes it. First, he has to see it, and then he has to see himself in it. And so, when I say uh, um, about the ideas one idea from another, one seed from another. I contained all those ideas. I would make little sketches, little scripts, and so on. But the best way in which I was able to do that was to fuse them into a cubicle of the cubicle of a poem, a small poem. Just compress all the ideas like a phrase, a synopsis, just a few words. Now, for those of you who are poets who know how to write or who have been in the habit of doing that. It's a beautiful way of taking words and 
put me your meanings into the words and then use them, arrange them the way you want to arrange them to, con to contain the ideas you want it to contain. So you could actually plant your own garden of words on a page. Uh, it's the same thing I do with some of these issues, which are not very pretty in some cases, like slavery and so on. I, I take them and I, I deal with them as if they are, um, it, like it's a garden that I have to rearrange a little so that I can make it um, adaptable to my aspirations of how I would like to see it happen. So, um, as I said, some of these topics are not very clean, they're not very um, happy, but yet there is something aesthetic about dealing with them, dealing with the ugliness within ourselves. You can still deal with the most derogative of ideas and the most, most destitute of situations in a way that you can take some essence or some, some wisdom out of it. And so this is what I try to do with these paintings. Now, uh, over the years, um, over the years, I had been scribbling these poems and containing these ideas in my mind. Um, it turned out to be some 22 paintings, 22 uh, poems. They preceded these paintings. These paintings were not done at that time. They were all just sketches and poems. So the poems, it is important for us to know that the poems preceded these paintings. So that when I was able to get down to work and I thought I am ready to do the painting, then I consulted with the poem to see, well, now where do I begin? So in order to get to the painting, I have to go back now, um, start off my poem to get the meat of what was in it, and then look for the images. Sometimes I would just, the image would just arrive at me in a dream or I would just be somewhere and I would encounter something in my daily experience and say, that's the image. And you will see how it reflects in some of the paintings I have done. And I connect the wisdom of the poem to the image. I say, here is my painting. And so these paintings took years to get done, very many years. Um, I, I never did it until I was very, very satisfied that the connection is real. So the style and all of that um, it is influenced by the connection that I made to the painting. Uh, this one is the very first of my transition series paintings, the one that <laughs> possibly took the longest to start. Um, I, I must have written the poem since 1983, and I did not actually do the painting until 1988. <laughs> so you imagine, um, because I couldn't find the appropriate image for it. Now, um, there was, however, I was able to make a connection. Um, so way down in my youth, in my childhood, one day, I saw a, and encountered an accident. We were, we were sleeping when we heard a loud bang, a crash two cars colliding. This is in the country in Guyana. And in the stillness of the night, you could imagine this thing sounded like a bomb. And so, of course, the neighbors, everybody woke up and everybody rushed out to the street to help out whoever they could. And I remember coming out there and uh, lots of people were there already attending to the dead and the wounded and the, the badly injured. And what I saw, I, I, I wouldn't say the other things I saw, but it left a, a lasting impression on my mind until today. 
uh, the mangled bodies and so on in the two cars was one thing. But on the floor, on the ground, on the road, all the smashed windscreen parts were spread on the floor, on the, on the ground. And the moonlight was shining on that, uh, on those um, pieces of glass, and it looked like diamonds. It looked, it shone everything like a diamond. It looked like diamond because of the moonlight. Now, um, when I, I, I'm an ardent student of history, so I, I would read, I'm self-proclaimed. I, I like to read my history. And in our country, um, there is a revolution of the, um, the, um, the Demar uprising in which um, the slaves have revolted and had um, taken their freedoms away from the Dutch, etc., etc. And there were two leaders of the revolution. One is Coffee, who was a house slave, and Akara, who was a field slave. Now you see the difference already. Their environment were very different. And so after they won the revolution, they came together. Here they are sitting and deciding how to go on from there. Coffee, of course, wanted to become the governor and, and they must run the, their jurisdiction like a, a, a real um, province. Akara wanted to do other things. He wanted to have fun. He wanted to, now that he's free, he wanted to go around and do whatever he wants and uh, enjoy life. The difference came. There's this schism. Of course, um, they settled it. However it happened, you can imagine the picture, however it happened, and they settled it in a duel, in which Akara won, and when Kofi lost, Kofi realized, well, I am not going to be governed and ruled by Akara, and I am not going to be responsible for all these people who are depending on me for their freedom under this jurisdiction of him. So he went, according to the account, historical account, he went and he shot himself. And so he said, I prefer die than get uh, recaptured. And so, of course, the revolution lost. And uh, every, the slaves were recaptured. And some were, um, uh, of course, Akara um, suffered on the wheel. And uh, some of the other slaves were made um, an example. And never again would you do such a thing. Um, but uh, if you can see the connection between the broken glass on the side of the road and where two cars might have smashed into each other, this is what we are at. We are at a crossroad. And some of us are in those crossroads in our lives, even in our daily lives, political lives, our career, etc., etc. So every one of these poems has a meaning, as a symbol, as a, a thing. And I can, I can, um, I, I will try to explain now on the, the consequences of our mistakes, you know. We make mistakes in this life. Revolutions have done that. Um, uh, this going on right now. There are revolutions all the time. And they all make mistakes. The leaders make mistakes, like Kofi and Akara did. And uh, we all have shortcomings in which, well, of course, both Kofi and Akara had their own shortcomings. They needed each other to become one to make the revolution concrete. They didn't. But out of the mistakes, we can see the, the wisdom and their jewels that are waiting in the, in the, in the evening, the darkness that are shining before our eyes. So out of it, I wrote, uh, this, is, this is a part of the poem that, that brought you to, to it. It says, the screen of life is smashed, and bits of ruptured visions sparkle. Passions that were wrought so deep seek to reborn in better light. In, in other words, out of a tragedy, we can we can really pick up gems of wisdom. That's what is painting. So the style of the painting, you will notice uh, 
the, is based on uh, the, the refraction, the broken glass, like a windscreen. So I'm saying, look at life through the broken windscreen and pick up the jewels and the gems that are in it. Uh, this was uh, the second. You notice we are still within the context of the Middle Passage. I was still thinking about the slave issues. And in this painting, I'm representing slaves in the hull of a ship. I've seen lots of sketches, drawings of them, and so on. It is not, not a pretty sight. Well, of course, it's not a pretty sight to have human beings lumped together as cargo. Um, uh, in many ways, we are lumped together that way today, and uh, we, don't, uh, we don't recognize it, but that's another issue. Um, here I'm showing the, the uh, uh, patch, uh, a group of slaves who are down there in the hall. These men who were captured, uh, many of them were dignified people. And here they are. They're not slaves. They're human beings who were captured, and they are, they are being used as, as uh, investment, as investment particles um, for, for profit. Um, the guy who is sitting in the middle there, um, we can suspect that he was probably a prince or something like that. And um, around him might be his, might have been his, some of his subjects who served under him. They were all captured. Um, the woman who is lying on the floor there, it's just symbolic. Um, you know, she probably was abused and so on. So in our faces are our shame. Um, could you imagine a prince knowing that his princess had been, had been devastated? The, the others are groaning, they are moaning, they are, the, what has happened to, the, to the, their lives? And look at their prince or their king sitting there. But he holds himself up in dignity. I deliberately did that. I wanted him to hold himself in dignity. Um, you must get past this and, and not let that um, depress you. Um, up in the corner, not everybody reacts that way to a tragic situation, to look at it clearly as they should. In each one of the, each one of the image here is a symbol of the different reactions that you will find with people when they are in a deadly situation like that. Be it a situation of war, poverty, um, even a case where you financially went bankrupt and you don't know what you do with yourself. This here um, is a symbol of what happens. But uh, I still want to say that our humanity, that aesthetic part of us that helps put us together, it unites us in the aspirations, in our aspirations throughout our struggles, even when the odds are piled up against us. There are people trying to hold themselves together, to keep warm, to, to encourage each other. The, the background of the picture, the, there, there, are, um, there is light penetrating into the, 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 the picture to, um, to give some light uh, um, that reflects off the people there. But you'll notice the first part of it is very warm. That gives you the impression that the light is coming from up those stairs somewhere there. Um, that's the only source of light. But the rest of it is bluish, bluish. It's very cold. The floor is probably very cold. The situation is, is very icy um, until it is reflecting like water on the ground. You can see the girl body being reflected and as if they were sitting in a river of coldness, a river of ice. So, but the, in the background, I have, I, I found this symbol of the interlocking hearts, which means love and togetherness and so on. And I wound it into the background of the picture, which actually makes it one. Um, 
as if to say, even in tragedy, you know, there can still be love and um, togetherness. This painting is called Awakening. Uh, as you look at the picture, you'll see some people who seem to have been encased into a wall are either freeing themselves or they are being freed by some uh, force. Um, there appears to be a, 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 a force of light that is like lightning that has struck there. You can see the shadows are very sharp. So it could be that the light that is um, that that caused it to happen. Well, um, I got the idea for this from the um, the Medusa, the idea of the Medusa from Greek uh, mythology, when Theseus was um, asked, not asked, but uh, given the task by his evil uncle to bring the Medusa to him, the head of the Medusa. And he went uh, and got, he went and defeated her. But it, 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 you need to know that um, Medusa had this power of just looking at you. She was, she was bewitched but she had this power of looking at you and turning you into stone. Uh, so I borrowed that idea and I compared it to slavery, capitalism, and all of those that have actually bewitched other countries, the countries wherever they landed. Wherever that force landed and the that system looked it in the eye, especially if it accepted or absorbed it, that culture was frozen into a wall and left, uh, uh, you know, that way. And some have remained that way until this day. But when the, when the, the renaissance of truth and wisdom breaks the Medusa course, when you, uh, when Theseus was able to caused the Medusa to see her face on his shield because he took the shield and he covered himself when she tried to look him in the eye and she saw herself instead of seeing Medusa. The spell broke. Not, not only she was horrified by her, um, I assume, that she was horrified by her own face and her own power. She was confronted with her own evil. He was able to take a sword and cut off our head. Immediately the spell broke and all the heroes who had been frozen in the walls um, that she used for the decoration of our chambers, they came out, they came back alive and they were, uh, you know, of course, some of them dazed, some of them still with the passion to get at the Medusa. They came out in all kinds of forms. I am symbolizing it here in this painting to show people reacting to their freedom in different ways. Like some of us who react to um, our freedom from slavery or assume the freedom from slavery. Um, oh, I'm free and so I can sing and dance. I'm free, I'm going to... Um, take vengeance like that girl who is coming out in all passion and that man uh, next to her, he's coming out determined to spend his life uh, in revenge. And uh, there is, uh, there is uh, one of our, our captives still in the wall, but he's philosophizing about it, philosophizing about Oh, um, you know, slavery was this or capitalism was this. And so we have a lot of scholars who can philosophize and theorize and all kind of things. The academics are very, very good. While some will remain on their knees always, always crawling, the victims, always crawling. Oh, I can't do anything because 
I mean the wall, because the wall, the, the, the thing of the wall is still on my back. Um, look at it all on my skin, and so on and so on. And there is that girl there, um, you know, giving thanks that she is free. Oh, at last I'm free, you know, and she has all her support systems around her. Watch the child carefully. The child is stuck. The child doesn't know whether to go left or right, still caught in the wall that she's supposed to be free from, while her mother is preoccupied with her past experiences, with the horror of the Gorgon, with the horror of the situation, and not taking care of the fact that, look, what can you do to help this child out? Take yourself out and take your child out. So the, 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 the painting um, has a lot of dimensions to it. Uh, I actually did sculpt the pieces onto the canvas. I used pumice and modeling paste to, to give the semblance of a wall and so on and so on. And then the, I actually did the painting after that. But it was an enjoyable experience doing this, um, doing this painting. Now, there's one point I make to you is that all these paintings are very, very large. This one, for example, is eight feet, um, eight feet wide by five feet high. So they are, they are almost life-size um, representations. And because I wanted my viewer, you, my viewer, to feel a part of it, to look into the eyes of the, um, of the, of the victims or whoever. Look into the picture and see yourself in the context of what the picture is trying to show to you. Okay. Uh, this painting is called Proselyte. A proselyte is somebody who is actually converting from one religious conviction to another. Um, my, originally, I, had, I, I called it between heaven and hell. Uh, um, now, exactly what I am trying to depict here. Uh, I'm thinking of the afterlife. I'm thinking of when we have lived our life a certain way, and we are certain that we have done the right thing all our life, and uh, after we are passing on, we are coming through the, the um, we're going to the, crossing the border into the other beyond. How convinced are we that we had really done the right thing? How convinced are, are we going to uh, our symbolic heaven or are we going to hell? So I call it proselyte. Why? Some of us have to spend some time somewhere and really muse upon our lives. Or maybe destiny is waiting for us and say, well, now think about it. Where do you think you should be? And you look, when you look into the picture there, you can see some people are in limbo. They are in purgatory. Oh, that's another title I was even thinking. I was toying with the idea what, what, to, what title to give the um, picture. But I got the image for this painting from, uh, I, from my garden. I have a garden and I had a compost heap and it had been there for years. I had been just piling grass and so on onto the compost heap and not, not using it, just leaving it to rot carefully. And eventually I thought, well, I think it's ready now. Let me, let me take out and put it into the bed. And I took my fork and I plunged it into the compost heap and I lifted up a huge stock of soil. And I could not bear to break that soil to put it onto the bed because it was so beautifully woven with, 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 with tunnels from, the, from worms, the worms that had been in there. Some beautiful, it looked like a work of art. 
I didn't want it. And I had always been looking for the image for this painting. I found it that afternoon, one day at 5 o'clock. And I stopped my gardening, and I went inside, and I sketched this scene. And never stopped until I finished painting it, between heaven and hell. Um, or your prejudices might be that you may say, oh, hell would be the place that is red and hot and orange and so on. And heaven would be the place that is nice and blue and so It's all up to you. You travel through the tunnels. Um, review your life carefully in purgatory. And the, the, the magnet of heaven will pull you to where you're supposed to be. Or hell will suck you into the heat. I don't know. Um, this painting is called Seeking. Uh, think of seeking what? Well, we can imagine that it is happiness you're seeking after. Uh, I, uh, the imagery I've, I've used here is, uh, is a symbol of the inside, the imaginary inside of a womb where conception is taking place or about to take place. Well, I'm not talking simply about that. Again, let's do some symbols because when conception takes place, an explosive something happens because a new life is born. And you, we, we enter into a new level of existence, a new state of mind. And uh, those, those three faces there, those three um, symbols there are, are um, you know, come from the Chinese proverb I heard, uh, see here and speak no evil. So those are the three. But look at the guy in, in the Buddhist posture. Everything that we achieve in terms of our state of mind comes from what we do, not necessarily what has happened to us. It's what we do with it, how we interpret it, how we respond to it. So just like a, um, a sperm and an egg, uh, a concept that finds its, its complement or match can fertilize and grow into a life of ultimate fulfillment. In other words, when you find your positive or your negative, that, co that complements you, if ever you find that, your life will take on a whole new dimension and it can change forever. So, this painting is merely, I'm merely trying to get you into that state of mind, say, have you found it? Do you know what it is? Are you looking for it? Some people do that. They go to religion. Some go into their readings. Uh, some go into meditation. Some go to drugs or some addiction of some kind. Um, but it's up to you. How do you intend to find your complement? Is that really what you're looking for? Or when you find it, is that really what you wanted? So this painting is supposed to be asking you some questions, some serious questions. Like I said before, um, we don't always deal with, in life, we don't, the landscape is not always pretty. It can get very ugly. And this painting is entitled Ascension. Uh, you will notice a spiraling light. Um, I call that a tornado of light. And I actually envisaged um, it. I said a tornado, meaning it is actually spinning and absorbing all the objects, sucking all the objects up into it. Now, this, 
this came from a, a discussion that used to be going on, I think it's in the 80s, when um, there was a lot of discussions about life after life. Everybody who had a near-death experience said they experienced going they, themselves, um, they saw a light and they experienced themselves being drawn by the light as if the light is sucking them up into it, into some heavenly source somewhere and so on. And, um, but that is not the basis on which the connection I made to that painting. This painting I did in reaction to the Jonestown massacre that took place in Guyana some time in, I think, 81 it was. Uh, um, on 79, I, I think. Uh, I was in the United States when that happened. And I quickly booked a flight, went back home because I wanted to know that my family was okay. Because it appeared that if things had just gone haywire, I could not believe that a thousand people had taken their lives, and, um, or whether it was taken from them. But they, most of them, as we know, um, they were happy to do what they did because they were sort of convinced that they were going to a good place. Now, um, so that painting is more or less like uh, the, the images below, I am, I'm saying, are just symbolic of the souls reaching up to the, to the source of their existence going off to, up to heaven or whatever it is. Um, our spiritual intuitions um, based on our human aspirations can take us to levels of wisdom and enlightenment beyond blind belief. We do, if, if we follow our own intuition, we can arrive at the place where we are supposed to be. We don't need someone to take us there. We can look into ourselves. As I always said, we are an aesthetic being, a spiritually aesthetic being. And we have in us, in our nature, innate in our nature, to find our own heaven. There is no need for someone to take us there. So that is, that is my, um, that was my thinking as I did that painting, essential. On the other hand, this one is called Players. They are a group of people playing um, cards, and they are onlookers. Uh, look carefully at the background, you will see one of the onlookers in the darkness looks like a ghost. There's another, there are two of them that look like ghosts. They're not in this, they have passed on. The trees, on the other hand, they look kind of spooky, don't they? Queer. The trees appear to be moving. They are busy playing. They're playing on the, on the crystal ball, the table with the crystal ball. There's a whirlpool of light on the table where they are playing. That, for me, is their crystal ball. So you, some of us, we want to find out about our future. We go to the, to the clairvoyant um, people. They, um, we get our palms red, or we go to, um, you know, in the Caribbean and all those places. We go to all these. Um, magical, those, those priests and all those people to ask about our lives, ask about our lives. We think we have the card, the trump card, to win the game of life. Once we know somebody, or we have money, or we have influence, or we got a degree, we have a PhD, we have a this, or, oh, we have the trump. Some of us work 
all our lives trying to get the right card so that we can play our trump, play and win, you see? But we are all throwing them all on the crystal ball because we don't know what the circumstances will be. Meanwhile, we have the young people who are watching on and they are learning from us how to indulge in such superstition and such, um, well, necromantic behavior. Um, you have even the matured people who don't have that kind of drive or enthusiasm, who lean on, on their leaders to give them that. So I, I, I say life is not a game of chance where we are empowered by winning cards and crystal balls of faith. Rather, it is a journey of paradoxes infused with the metaphors of, of lessons our spirits are hungry to learn. So we, can, we don't need the card. We don't need a lotto. We need ourselves. We need our self-confidence. We need our own spirit to begin to, to well, influence our own destiny. So you are the chief player. You are the main player in your game of life. This, um, this painting is called Crusade. I take a good look at it. Um, no, it's not the kind of crusade that um, uh, you, not the typical crusade. But I borrowed the idea from the idea of crusades because um, uh, there was the first, the, the first, second crusade, um, you know, the, 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 in history, the dark ages and so on and so on and so on. Um, what, did you, what do you grasp from that? From the dark ages, the, the first, second and third crusade, you know, it was religious based, of course. Full from, uh, full initiated from ideology, ideological differences, perhaps not. Maybe that's just a sham, who knows? Um, it's not for me to say. But what, what is very, um, what, what I found as I thought very deeply about that topic, I found that the embodiment of a philosophy that goes out of control can transform its enthusiasts into vessels of self and mass destruction. Uh, think of it, just a simple little idea, that's why it's symbolized in a book. We have a book, it's a book, open book with a flame. It's a beautiful idea, a very good idea. There are very good ideas that have uh, uh, passed through uh, uh, the ages of civilization. Wonderful ideas. We had great uh, philosophers and thinkers who have given us great ideas. Revolutionists have come with some great ideas and have given us. Guess what? Many of those ideas if you do not control them or place them within the context in which they are appropriate to be used, they can go out of control. They can start a fire, and that fire can be very destructive. So as a page, um, as a flame, we say, um, there's a Bible term that says, thy word is a lamp unto my path. As a flame lights, the light of wisdom, the inspiration that comes from those ideas, you see, can be constructive or destructive. And so there we are, we see the flame opening, the pages open to new ideas and new dimensions, and pages turn into weapons, and uh, fl the flame um, just inoculates the reader and turns him into a kettle 
that gets out of control and eventually turns into a bomb and they explode. When they, they now they fall off from the bomb, begins to burn the pages of the book. That is exactly what happens when ideas go out of control. They're not controlled by the aesthetics of our human impulses, our human mind. When in the landscape of our mind, we don't clear and plant our garden properly and, uh, and say, well, I want my aesthetics to be in the right place. It must be humane, not commercial, not just one-sided. It must be holistic. Whenever it is not, fire starts, the flame begins to grow, and it goes out of control. So much out of control, eventually we are consumed by it. Uh, this, this painting is called The Door, and it was actually executed on a door, as you can see, um, framed by, by uh, door rims, everything because I wanted it to be a door. Um, it is symbolic of the door of opportunities. The orange and red and so on is a fire from, imagine a volcano, and the volcano erupts. Now what is the volcano? It's the anger of people humanity on the suppression. We hear the rumblings of the volcano in protests, labor, labor, uh, labor issues, etc., etc. And uh, leaders do their, do their best to keep the protests down. Eventually, a volcano erupts. And they realize something is coming. And so in the painting, those little patterns, calligraphic patterns, are the channels of the flowing volcano as the, as the lava begins to flow. And you know a lava could be very destructive. It's the anger of people coming to take you to task for your promises you made, the jobs you were going to prepare. The, you know, every election, there are jobs. Every leader says, look, don't believe in me. I will give you what you need. And so the volcano rolls. And I'm showing the volcano arriving at the door with the heads of those who were victimized by it. But the interior surface where they arrive for the opportunity to be fulfilled is cold and frozen. Cold, nicely air conditioned for those who are inside. And so what does it do? It freezes the volcano at the head of the door. So all of them are left bundled up there at the door. They can't come in because the, the, the frozen atmosphere within, on the inside, is locking them out and freezing them up, and the volcano begins to harden. And so they are all piling on each other there. They are fighting with each other. They are having issues out there because more and more the volcano would flow and come to the door. And so uh, what, what do we get out of this? I say it is not fair to, to channel talented human minds to dead-end frozen doors of artificial opportunities, simply to frustrate them into devaluating their potentials so that they can be utilized for free or for little or nothing. It is a form of exploitation of situations. You bring out a whole host of people to, to seek the same job. You create, you, you, you train them, you skill them, you give them the kinds of skills 
where there are limited opportunities for those jobs. You are just freezing them at the door. In this painting, we are looking at the um, at a group of people. Um, they are all lined up to a box office. And uh, are they going to church? Or are they going into uh, a celebration of some kind? Well, they all seem to have their tickets. Whatever is going on behind that uh, box office is glaringly bright. It seems to be the fun is behind there. But what those on the outside, all they are getting are the impressions of the stained glass um, on into their faces and across their minds. So that painting is called Sold Out. In, in, it's depicting that those people there have been, their tickets have been rejected. Their efforts at getting past the barrier behind the wall to enjoy the privileges of, of their efforts is just locked out. They're locked out of their own heaven. And so um, look carefully at them. You see, it, it's not, they, they have, the, the, the stained glass portion there of the, of the painting that is imprinting itself on them are like bars it crossing their mind like, like cages, like they have been caged out of their happiness. So, so I said, those who, ha those who do not have access to the benefits and rewards of their belief, not only their belief, but their convictions, will inevitably suffer the consequences of, those dis of, of, of their disbelief. Because they will not believe what has happened. And they will suffer the consequences for having believed that. And that is what I'm arousing, raising the question or asking um, the viewer and the, to investigate that landscape in which they are, they are existing. This painting I call Caesar. Now those of you who know about Caesar, it, it's a play instrument where, um, a play equipment where uh, one child would be on one side and the other one will be on the other side. Um, I used to play that kind of thing when I was a kid, where you would go and boys versus girl, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and somebody will come and just uh, uh, jump on one side and cause the seesaw to go up. Now, in this case, we're looking at, at uh, the situation, another issue, the issue of families. The issue of families that is being used, uh, constantly being used uh, as a blackmail instrument, a black, blackmail tag by not only politicians, uh, religious leaders, and revolutionists. They're all trying to protect the family. They're all looking after women's rights. They're always looking after, um, you know, the, the, the integrity and the sacredness of families and the decisions that they make after they get in are always destructive to families, except their families. Uh, you see, um, clarity and concern for family are being used as a puppet show to mock the, view, the, the virtues and pride of womanhood. So 
in there, I, um, I show this woman who was probably trapped in a demon swamp. And the, the time came for them to say, well, um, where, where is the woman, this, this beautiful woman that, that, um, that we, we knew existed there? And so they, 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 they wash her clean and they bring up and say, look, there's where you are. And they cause magical poppy flowers, white poppy flowers to fall from heaven as if to say, well, look, you see, she's happy. She's happy. Take a look at her. But when the flower hits the swamp, the truth comes out. You see the, pop, the, the white flowers turn red with the blood of the generation of people that had been uh, so captivated or abused. Um, take those flowers, you will notice all of those that have hit this, this thing, they have become red with blood. But above, they are, they look nice, they're very beautiful, um, but we see an exhausted woman. She's not even able to participate in the puppet show that has been made of her, because that is what we always do with our women. We, we always, in every aspect of society, we have always used women like scapegoats. The virtues we use in such a, a, a ridiculous manner. And we have the courage to say we are doing it in the interest of women and families. Now, similar to the, to the woman who, um, who was in the, in the swamp with the demons, Seesaw, this is the male version I call scapegoat. Um, it seems as though um, we love a landscape where we always have a special group of people that we must always blame for everything that has gone wrong. Oh, our society would be so perfect if only these people were not around or if only these people would do the right thing and if only this and if only that. Meanwhile, we have our system in place to make certain that they can't do it. Uh, we have them in the swamp. We have them, we only want to, we always want to keep them there, down in the swamp, in the cesspit, where we can say, you see them? That's all they want to do. They, all, they only want to be in the swamp there. They love it down there. But in this picture, I am trying to show the the, the, the scapegoat, the, the guy who had been held captive, he suddenly saw the light. He said, look, I want to get out of here. I'm going to get out of here. And he really um, steeled himself to, to be strong enough to pull himself out of the pit in which he had been held captive. And so... The, the, the demonic hands are trying to hold him back. There's always systems in place for those who are trying to come out of the pit, where you know you could snatch them, um, even, even ahead of them. That by the time they reach this second or third stage, there's a way we can get them to slip so that we can drag them back in to the pit where we want them to belong. And so but this guy is tearing those hands apart and he is going up to come out of this deadly demon pit, to go up into the light to where his destiny can unfold. You ready? Uh, this painting is called Guardians. Uh, You will notice in the picture there are chambers. Um, I got the concept for these chambers from our, our old time key locks, you know, those traditional key locks that had several chambers. 
where you had to turn um, three, four times to open your door or turn three, four times to close it. Um, I was looking for a lock for my door, a special lock, kind of antique kind of lock. And I saw this and it fascinated me. It gave me the idea for this painting. Uh, in the distance, the light that is penetrating behind there uh, just symbolize it to the Holy Grail, um, this Holy Grail from the myth of the um, King Arthur's legends, where they, the knights were looking for this Holy Grail. Well, the Holy Grail is our highest aspirations, whatever we want to achieve in life, our dream then that we have in, uh, on a national level, you could call it um, like in America, you could call it the American dream. Uh, whatever you want to call it, let's assume that is your holy grail. In your life, oh, I want to be a millionaire, or I want to be a this, or I want to be a that. Um, but there are chambers that, are, that you have to, that you need to process to get to where you want, to turn that key to get to where you want to go. And there are guards, there are guardians, there are those who don't want you to be there. And they are very vigilant because they are outsiders and they are insiders. They are those who will not be allowed to pass the first chamber. I and mean, what is interesting is that those in one chamber, they, don't, they are isolated from the others in the other chamber. And they are isolated from the, those in the other chamber. And it keeps going on like that. So nobody knows who is who and what they're doing. But they all feel that they are all committed to this one task of guarding the Holy Grail or the dream, or the aspiration. It's like what we think. Oh, I, I want to be this, you see, and I am going to try hard to be this. But the chambers are there. And what we do in one chamber, we don't want to connect it to what is going on to the other chamber, realizing that we have to eventually get to where we want to be by passing these chambers. Meanwhile, the outsiders, we are preventing the outsiders from getting in. The outsiders are suffering in all the, in all the most ridiculous ways. Now take a look at the picture. The paradox in it is, why are the outsiders suffering outside of the wall when the door is wide open? There's a wide open door. Why are they still clinging to walls? Um, that is it. Many, uh, I said, hypocrites guard the patriots who guard the doors. They open wide to provide the reasons and places for invaders to hide and enter. They give the impression that they are doing something to save the dream, to save the security, and so on and so on whatever word they use, and that these are outsiders, these are, you know, I won't call words, but they are, they are names, they are given names, you know. Um, the names change according to, um, according to history, historical period, it changes. But the same people that they are guarding the, the, um, the Holy Grail from, they themselves, are using the same people and protecting them, bringing them in and using them.